afternoon, everybody. Bill Lester here with uh, University of Florida IFAS Extension Service in Hernando County. And let me check real quick here to make sure everything is working correctly here on Facebook. And there I am. Looks like everything's going to work today, or at least for the moment. Hopefully, everything will keep working. Um, just want to give a, a little short class slash discussion uh, slash talk on um, growing vegetables in containers. So I do have a PowerPoint presentation here. Let me go ahead and open that up and get started here. Okay, there we go. Hopefully everybody can see that. Um, going to be talking a little bit about growing vegetables in containers. Now, I made a post a few days ago uh, asking for ideas and suggestions on what we can give these little short classes on. And one of the suggestions was growing vegetables in containers. It was pretty much one of the first suggestions. So I figured we'd go ahead and start with that. And if this works out well and everybody likes it, everybody wants it, we could try to do this every week. We want to try to add um, value for you being a member of our Facebook group. We want to be able to answer your questions, give short classes, give you ideas, things you can try in your own yard. And then if you have problems, just ask us. That's what, you know, University of Florida Extension is here for, is to try to answer your questions. If I don't know what the answer is, I can find it out because I work with a lot of really smart people up there in Gainesville. Um, and I can send them pictures, I can give them a phone call and get an answer to your question. So talking a little bit about growing vegetables in containers, and this is something that I do myself, and you're going to see quite a few pictures in here from my garden, things that I've grown in the past or I'm growing right now. So very first, I just want to make a real quick mention. If any of you are interested in any of the different classes that we're offering virtually online now, either through Facebook Live or through Zoom. We do have a web page. If you just go to Hernando Extension, all one word, dot com, you're going to see um, a whole listing here of all the different classes that I'm offering, others in our office are offering. Uh, our County Extension Director, Jim Davis, gives classes on wildlife and household pests and our Sea Grant Extension agent Brittany Hall Sharp gives classes on marine wildlife and a number of kids' classes. So go to HernandoExtension.com on a regular basis. And as soon as we schedule a class, we make a Facebook event for it and it automatically shows up in this feed. So it's a really good place to uh, one stop shopping to keep on top of everything that we have going on. So, a few of the things I was going to cover very briefly today because I do want to leave time for questions at the end. Um, that you, If you want to ask questions and you're watching on Facebook, just go ahead and type your questions in. At the very end, I can turn to my left and look at the iPad and read your questions off and answer on them. A few of the things I was going to cover is some of the advantages and disadvantages of not growing your garden out there in the dirt, in the native soil some options for different types of containers because we're talking about a lot more than just pots here. Uh, basically any type of structure that's going to contain quality potting soil you can think of as a container. How to get started growing in containers and then some quick hints for success with different vegetables. So first of all here's a picture I like to share that I found once before. This is a traditional Florida vegetable garden and don't feel bad, I've never had a garden that looked that large or that good. So a lot of us uh, are gonna struggle with our gardens. You might have different leaf spot, fungal problems, issues like that. So don't feel bad if your garden doesn't look quite this good, most of them don't. And they don't have to look perfect either because I think the main goal that we're all shooting for is actually producing our own quality fruits and vegetables on our own in our yard. So if you're able to achieve that, sure, we all want a, an attractive, nice looking garden. And a lot of the tips I'm gonna give you today for putting them in containers is gonna help get you there.
but things don't have to look perfect. They usually don't. So if you do have a traditional vegetable garden out in your backyard, like I do, I went out there and I live in Spring Hill and I'm in the process of still digging up an area for a vegetable garden. There are a lot of things that are hiding in your soil. You may think it's all just sand, but mixed in with that sand are nematodes. Nematodes are microscopic uh, little roundworms, many of which feed on fungi, they feed on bacteria, they feed on a variety of different things. Many of them are very, very important to have in a healthy soil, but there are some species of nematodes that feed on plant roots. And some of the plants that they feed on are gonna be the vegetables that you're growing in your garden. So um, two very good examples would be root knot nematodes for any of you that have maybe grown tomatoes in the past. Your tomatoes may start to wilt, die. At the end of the season, if you pull the plants up and you look at the roots, the roots have all these little bumps and balls on them. You probably have root knot nematodes. And what they do is they damage the plant's roots so it can't take up water and nutrients as well. And the plants are gonna suffer and eventually die. For anybody who is growing right now okra in your garden, root knot nematodes love okra. It is their favorite plant to feed on. So if you have root knot nematodes really bad in your garden, you're gonna have a tough time growing okra because pretty quickly your okra plants are gonna start wilting during the day, looking really bad. And if you pull them up, you're gonna see they literally have no roots left. So that was nematodes that did them in. Many of the different um, plant pathogenic bacteria and fungi that are gonna cause problems on your plants, they cause leaf spots. I see now on a lot of Facebook groups, people are asking questions about their cucumbers and summer squash. Why do they have spots all over the leaves? Leaves are dying. A lot of times those fungal spores are in the soil. So if you grow a garden in the soil, when it rains or when you irrigate and the soil splashes up on the bottom leaves, the fungi get on the leaves and now you're gonna have a leaf spot problem. There's a number of insects that live in the soil. Uh, wireworms are immature click beetles. They can feed on plant roots. The picture you see on the right here, those are scarab beetle grubs. They feed mostly on grass. They are an occasional problem in vegetable gardens, not very often. They're out there, but they're not a huge problem. A main problem that we have with our soil here in Central Florida, that for anybody who's moved here from another part of the country, we only have maybe one to 2% organic matter naturally in our soil. So if any of you have lived and garden in, let's say, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, out there in the Midwest, they typically have about, I think, 14% organic matter out there. That's why things grow really well. That's why your soil holds water better than it does here, because the problem with sandy soils is they drain well. They drain really well. So on a sunny day, you water your garden, you go out a few hours later, the, the soil's dried out, your plants are wilting again. That's because you don't have organic matter there to hold the water in, hold the nutrients, and actually provide your plants with a certain number of nutrients. So that brings us to very low water holding capacity. Now on a day like today where it rained at my house very hard earlier and the water started to really pile up in the swale out in front of my house, when it stops raining within 15 minutes, it's all gone because I have a very sandy soil, it drains well. But the problem in the backyard with my vegetable garden is I water it in the morning and by noon it's dried out again. So there are a lot of, um, issues with native soils here in Central Florida, and you can avoid a lot of these problems if you're growing things in containers. So some of the advantages of leaving that garden and the garden soil behind, you can totally avoid nematodes because when you're growing in containers, you don't want to take the natural soil you have in your yard and fill your containers with that because obviously you're taking all the problems and issues in that soil, putting them in a container, and you're still gonna have those problems. You haven't solved any problems. Um, it's very easy if you're growing in containers to control the drainage, the soil structure, the pH, the fertility, the organic matter, because you're, you're creating a contained 
growing area within that container. It's a lot easier to do there than it is in a large garden out in the middle of your backyard. <clears throat> and of course, a lot of times this can be a lot easier to maintain physically than a large in-ground garden. Keep in mind, and I'm sure any of you watching who have a large garden in the ground, it's a lot of work. You're out there with a shovel. If you have problems with tree roots, you have to take a pickaxe and chop them out. Uh, you might run across leftover construction materials. We don't have a whole lot of rocks here in Central Florida, but we have some. So it's a lot of work. And if you're unable to perform that work, you might be thinking, well, gosh, I guess I just can't grow vegetables. Well, you can, and I have a couple of ideas here about how you can go about doing it. And even for people that are even more limited physically, they can still have a successful garden also if you follow a couple of these ideas. So one of them is a raised bed garden. And I know a lot of people do this, uh, and it could be as simple as using wooden boards. They could be treated, untreated. Uh, you can make them out of a lot of other materials I'm gonna list in a moment. But this is where you build, essentially, if you think about it, it's a big container, it's a big box. And you're gonna bring in quality soil and put it in the uh, raised bed garden. Now, over time, some of the nematodes and other problems that are in the soil underneath can move into your raised bed garden. So long-term, that can be an issue. But if you look online, there's directions for a lot of really great ideas where you can make accessible gardens, if you build them at the correct height, they could be wheelchair accessible. And what this is, is a planting box that's raised up even higher. If you look closely at the picture on the right, there are wheels underneath those boxes, so they can be moved around. So really, whatever um, physical limitations you might have or whatever physical um, point you might be in in your life, there are still ways around it, and there's still ways that you can grow your own vegetables at home also. So we don't want people to think that if you're unable to get out there on your hands and knees and swing a shovel and a pickaxe, you're gonna be excluded from joining in because you're really not. So with raised bed gardens, some different ideas for materials you could use to make one. You can use untreated wood. The problem with that is it's only gonna last a few years because the moisture, uh, potentially carpenter ants and other insects that might get into it, are gonna break that wood down and it's not gonna last forever. As a general rule, with raw untreated wood, it's gonna last for three years before it starts falling apart and you're gonna to have to start replacing it. You can use some of the different treated wood products that are available out there now. They are not like you know your grandparents treated wood. They're not treated with uh, arsenic and creosote like they used to be years ago because they were not safe to use in a uh, raised bed garden where you're growing edible plants. The materials they use now are much safer to be used in a raised bed. If you're still uncomfortable with that, you can use treated wood to build the raised bed box and then line it with plastic. You can use a thick enough uh, three mil or thicker plastic to go between the soil and the wood, and that's gonna help stop anything that may leach out of that wood from getting into your soil. You can build them out of stone. Uh, you can build them out of brick. I know cinder blocks work very well. Um, bamboo, you can use, um, if you have access to fallen trees or trees that maybe you've had to cut down, um, pine trees tend to work very well. You know, obviously it can get a little heavy moving around and building it, but you can build the raised bed box out of fallen trees. And over time, they're gonna break down. They're gonna turn into basically slow compost. And that's all gonna be really good to be mixed back in with the soil that you're growing your plants in. Or hay bales is a very popular way of building these raised bed gardens. Uh, you can make the outline with bales of hay and over one or two years, that hay is gonna break down. You can start to work the hay into the soil. It's constantly gonna be decaying, composting, and you're always gonna be building up the soil and adding to it over time as that hay breaks down and you keep working it in. So some of the different container options that you could use, 
The nice thing now is if you go to the stores and look, there are a lot of different options. You get small containers, large ones, very large ones. The ones they make out of plastic now can be very, very large and you go to pick them up, it's like, oh, this only weighs about a pound or so. It's very lightweight. A couple things that you need to keep in mind with them is if you're using clay, clay and terracotta actually breathes. So moisture, is gonna leave the soil and actually move out through the clay pot. So anything you're growing in a clay pot might dry out quicker than in a plastic pot. So you're gonna to have to keep a real close eye on the moisture and moisture level of the plants growing inside of the pot. And I've noticed that with many plastic pots that you buy nowadays, you have to be very careful because a lot of them come, don't come with drainage holes in them. Some of them may have a little spot for the drainage hole, but it's not drilled all the way through. What I do is I take my electric drill and just, you know, drill a couple holes in the bottom. You always have to double check to make sure they have drainage holes, because otherwise what happens is you'll water the plant after you have it in the container and the water won't drain out. It sits there and things can get really, really nasty with the soil and the water inside that pot. So proper drainage is very important. What kind of soil are you going to use in the container? I always recommend using a quality potting soil, and there's a lot of different brands out there for that. Sometimes the ones that are on sale, it's only 99 cents a bag. You pick it up and it's really heavy, it's wet, might smell a little strange or a little bad. You may want to avoid those because quality potting soils are made out of soilless materials. It's usually a mixture of uh, peat or peat moss or perlite or bark. It's formulated where it's going to provide really good drainage. The water is going to drain really well through it, but it's going to hold a certain amount of water so it doesn't drain too quickly and dry out too quickly. There's a lot of products now that include a fertilizer in it. That doesn't hurt. Uh, you can get it with or without fertilizer. You know, we don't have a specific recommendation one way or the other. Either one is going to work well. If you're growing something in a very, very large decorative container, you may want to fill the very bottom with possibly wood chips. You can get the um, plastic packing peanuts now that uh, are made out of cellulose and they break down. You can put a layer of them in the bottom also. If you're growing a plant that doesn't need that much room for its roots to stretch down, you can fill the bottom with something that's gonna weigh less than soil because you always wanna remember if you have a large container that only weighs a pound or so, once you fill it with dirt, it's gonna be heavy and it's gonna be very difficult to move around. So you wanna probably place it in a spot where you're not gonna to have to move it, you're gonna be happy with it and that's where it's gonna stay. So um, a few other things to keep in mind about containers. You can use mulch. Um, a lot of times people growing ornamentals, if you put some mulch on the surface of the potting soil in the pot, that helps to hold in water better. It's gonna help deter weeds from popping up in it because weed seeds still get around. Even if you're growing things in pots, weed seeds can blow in with the wind, land on the soil, you might still have a weed issue also. Try to put, like I said, those large containers where they're going to stay. And you need to put them in a place where it's safe for them to drain. You see in this picture, there's a container grown plant and you water it. It drains, that which is good. It has drainage holes at the bottom. That's really good also. If the water drains all over your sidewalk, that's going to encourage algae and mold to grow. Might get slippery and dangerous. You may want to use a saucer or something to put under that pot. But if you use saucers under containers in your yard, when you water the plants, the saucers are gonna fill with water. And what's gonna happen in a few days during the summer is you will have mosquitoes breeding in those saucers. So you wanna flush them out and dump them on a very regular basis. Otherwise, you're gonna just be adding to your uh, mosquito issues in your yard. So you wanna keep a close eye on that. So a container gardening, just about any kind of vegetables can be grown in containers. It's a good option for obviously apartments, rooftops, balconies, terraces. If you wanna grow out on a patio, 
out on a lanai, if you're growing around your swimming pool, um, if you live in a homeowners association and you want to start uh, growing some things out front, but it has to be something that's attractive and looks good, you, you go out and purchase attractive containers. You don't have to grow just flowers in those containers. You can put vegetables in them also. Uh, and if you maintain them well and you choose the correct vegetables at the right time of year, it can look really nice also. So maybe your neighbors won't even notice that you're growing vegetables out there and they're not gonna you know, complain about you or send nasty letters about you to the HOA. You can use almost any kind of container to grow your vegetables in just as long as it's big enough to hold enough soil for the roots for whatever type of plant you're growing and provides adequate drainage. So you see in the picture here, that's a really good example. Some people, I have master gardeners that are very artistic and have beautiful yards and they have things growing in every type of container you might imagine. I'm not nearly that creative or crafty or artistic to think of those things. But if you look online, you can come up with a lot of really great ideas of how to make your yard look nice and be productive also. So here's a few pictures and examples. You can grow things in hanging baskets like you see on the left. They built um, a structure with poles and it's a little hard to see, but you can run very stiff wires or more poles across the top to hang those hanging baskets from. The one in the middle here is straight out of my backyard. That's red burgundy okra. That's coming up and growing very nicely right now. I have it growing in a container in a rock bed area that's out on the other side of our swimming pool in the backyard. Looks attractive and I'm looking forward to having lots of red okra very soon here. Picture on the right is some more hanging baskets and you can see somebody growing banana squat or banana peppers in them. There are peppers that grow very large, you know, fairly large. The plants will get waist high maximum, but there's other ones where the plants naturally stay a little bit smaller, but can be very prolific. You see in the picture, there's quite a few peppers growing on those plants, just growing in hanging baskets in somebody's backyard. You can use just regular, um, Nursery pots, the black plastic ones that maybe when you go to the nursery and buy a plant that it comes in. I save all mine. So you can grow vegetables in them, but you have to match the size of the pot with the kind of vegetable you're growing and how many you want to put in that pot. So something as small as just a one gallon pot, you can grow individual herbs. Uh, that's really all you need to, for growing most herbs in whether it be a couple basil plants, oregano, mint, they all do fine in a small container like one gallon. Uh, during the winter, you can grow one or two or three lettuce plants because they don't take a lot of room. Their root structure isn't really large. Any kind of greens, um, mustard greens, turnip greens, collards, Swiss chard, all those different things. If you're only growing a few of them, you can grow in a one gallon pot. You would need something a little bit larger, like a three gallon pot to grow more lettuce plants. You can grow carrots in a three gallon pot. Uh, greens, any kind of greens, like I just mentioned, green beans, yellow beans, cucumbers can grow in a three gallon pot. You can usually get, I would put like two or three cucumbers in a three gallon pot. Keep in mind, something like cucumbers are going to need a trellis also or a fence, chain link fence to grow up. Now, a lot of vegetables that just naturally make larger plants are gonna need at least a five gallon pot. So if you wanna grow tomatoes, peppers, squash, eggplants, you're gonna grow generally one plant per pot and it needs to be a five gallon pot, but you can definitely successfully grow one tomato plant, a five gallon pot, one pepper plant, one squash plant, one eggplant. You can get creative and experiment and try getting more than one in the pot. But what happens is depending on what variety it is and how well it grows, if you have too many plants in one pot, they may, the roots may outgrow the size of the pot and the amount of soil you have there. And then you're going to have issues where you're going to have to water it multiple times a day or the plant's going to stop growing and you're not going to get a very good harvest off of it. But there's, you have a lot of room to play with. You can try different varieties. 
try one tomato per five gallon pot, two, three, whatever it might be, and see what works best for you and how you can fine tune it to start getting really uh, your best harvest out of it. So some different things and different ideas and some you know reminders and warnings here of what you can grow in pots. Uh, these are all things that are cool season crops. It is way too early to be planting them now. I see people on Facebook wanting to plant these things because they're just, they're used to thinking maybe how they grew things up north. Everything has to be grown in the summer here. Here in Central Florida, some things grow in the summer, some things in the fall, and a lot of things grow in the winter. So these are all really good choices that you can grow in containers, but you wanna grow them in winter. You don't wanna start them until maybe September at the earliest. Right now, it's just way, way too hot and too humid for these. But things like individual broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, uh, green peas, snow peas, you need a trellis for those. Onions, and I have some pictures of green onions that I grew in a container. Spinach, they all do just fine. Uh, some cool season crops that are also too, too early to grow right now that grow pretty quickly. Uh, different types of lettuce, radishes, carrots, different types of Asian greens. And these all do really, really well here in Central Florida at the right time of year. You have to plant them in the winter or the cooler time of year. They're not going to do well now. Things like bok choy, Chinese cabbage. If you look through seed catalogs, there are a lot of different novelty Asian greens. That all of them do well here but only during the winter, not right now. So warm season crops that you may still have growing that you planted this spring, a lot of these are gonna wrap up really soon. They're gonna succumb to the heat, the humidity, the rains, the fungal diseases, the insects. You're gonna lose the battle with these, but really soon, it, starting in really the middle of July, you could be starting seeds for all these things to grow once again in the fall. So things like tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants, you're going to start, if you're growing them from seed, you're going to start those seeds uh, around the middle of July. And then in August or September, you're going to transplant them out into your garden or into the containers they're growing in. And you can grow them all again in the fall and get a whole nother crop from them. Cucumbers, melons, cantaloupes, watermelons, and summer squash, you can try again in the fall, but it's really, really difficult because all the insects and diseases and problems you're having with them now are all still going to be here this fall. So generally, the best way to be successful with them is try to plant them very, very early in the spring. Here, you can really start in late February. I know people that start in mid-February. And if you're lucky, we don't have any really horrible freezes uh, in February or March. They're not going to freeze and they're going to grow and do well. The trick is to try to get them in really early and beat the diseases and insect pests and heat and humidity and rain so that they grow fast, they grow healthy. You're going to get cucumbers, you're going to get squash, and they're all going to be done before the beginning of June after which you're gonna to have too many insect and disease problems. And then what happens is people are tempted and they're asking us, what kind of pesticides do I spray? I'm gonna fertilize them, I'm gonna water, 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 and all those different things are not gonna work well. Uh, and you're gonna go wasting a lot of resources, spending a lot of money on things that if you just concentrate on starting as early as you can, that gives you the best chance of being successful with them. But bush beans and pole beans, don't forget you can start them again in the fall. You can grow bush beans very easily in containers, three gallon pots, they do just well, just fine. And you're gonna put them out and plant them um, starting in August, August or September, and they grow fast. You should get a good harvest from them in the fall, hopefully before we start to get any really cold freezing weather again in the winter. So real quickly, here are uh, some pictures of things that I've grown in the past myself. And most of these were things I grew in the winter. So parsley and dill, both of those are growing in, I think, five gallon nursery pots. 
parsley does great, dill does great, but you want to grow them in the winter. If you grow them right now, what's gonna happen is you're gonna get all these really, really huge caterpillars on them. They turn into beautiful um, swallowtail butterflies, the kind of thing that you really want to attract to your butterfly garden. But parsley and dill, if you're growing it for you to eat or dry and preserve, you want to grow them in, during the winter because you know, those caterpillars aren't out during the winter. And the parsley and dill are going to grow fine. They're going to taste really good. You're going to be able to harvest a lot. Dill can grow into a really, really large plant. It gets waist high or higher. And you only need a couple of dill plants to, to provide your entire family with fresh dill. You can dry it. You can freeze it. There's a lot of different things you can do to stretch that dill through the summer until the next winter rolls around when you can grow it again. But I grew these in pots and they did just great. Lettuce you see on the left here, I saved um, a little styrofoam container. Uh, you may get these if you ever order something online that has to be refrigerated or frozen and you're thinking, what can I do with this little styrofoam container? It's too small to, to pack a lunch in and take it to the beach or anything. Drill some holes in the bottom for drainage and grow vegetables in it. That was plenty big enough for me to successfully grow. That looks like a type of romaine there on the left. And I grew green onions in five gallon buckets you see on the right here. That's all you need for a number of green onion plants. And carrots, carrots can do quite well in containers. Um, even the varieties that grow really, really deep and give you really, really large carrots as long as your container is more than deep enough for those carrots to stretch down and not hit the bottom when they're growing, that works just fine. Once again, this is just a five gallon bucket that I was growing vegetables in. You can see that I got carrots. Um, I took those buckets and drilled a hole down near the bottom and put basically a drainage spout down there. You can see the little black rubber uh, grommet that if you put that around the hole that you drill, and put a PVC pipe in, that's all you need for drainage. These buckets lasted me for a number of years before they broke down eventually from the heat and the sun because everything breaks down outdoors eventually. Um, and I even grew celery in a five gallon bucket. You can see that did really well. Celery takes a long time to grow and you're gonna grow that during the winter here. Don't try to grow celery now during the summer. It does not like heat and it's not gonna do really well. If you plant it in September and give celery plenty of water, it doesn't like to get dried out. It doesn't mind lots and lots of irrigation. It can grow really well, grow it all um, winter long. And you see on the right, the um, it doesn't get really huge um, stems or ribs like grocery store celery does, but you can just go in there and pick out uh, you know, a number of the stems and leaves to enjoy for dinner that night. Did really well for me, very easy to grow too. So those are just a couple of ideas and hopefully it gave you a couple of uh, suggestions, kind of get you thinking for what you can incorporate or use in conjunction with an in-ground garden because you can use both of them. There's certain things that do really well in the ground because you need the extra room other things do really well. In containers, you can grow certain things that look attractive in attractive containers, work them in your front yard. If you live in a homeowners association, it's gonna look good and you're gonna actually get some food out of them also. So um, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to contact us.